Hey everybody, Mr. Dustin here. Welcome to Bible Class. Now, we had recently discussed families and kind of what they look like, but today I want to get into a little bit of how does each family member function? What do they do? Not just who lives there. So we already talked about, you know, who lives with you in my house. It's me and Miss Megan and, of course, my Bible class buddy, Toby. But in the ancient Middle East, not only did parents and their children live together, but, of course, they had grandparents, aunts and uncles and cousins and all this big, um, I'm going to call it a cohort, a big group of people that lived together. And that there's a few reasons for that. Loyalty and respect for one's family was very important Um because families, they were thought to be woven together by God. And I think, I think really that's still true, that God creates families. Uh, families lived close together for uh, protection, honestly, because there were robbers and bands of thieves and things that would, would be going around doing things that we don't really have today. Uh, they would be there for companionship. They would be there to help each other with their herds. The, the livestock, of course, is a, is a real challenge. They would have Families, uh, farming uh, rather, so they would be agricultural in nature, trying to help work the fields. And of course, just with all the children, they'd be helping each other raise them. Now, tent dwelling families, people who didn't live in houses, but in a, a tent, such as Abraham and Isaac, they all camped together in, in a very large encampment. Uh, again, for company, we're not out here alone, but also for protection, either from robbers and bandits or literally sometimes from wild animals. Uh, so only in very, very desperate circumstances did a family member usually leave from their own family. For instance, a bad drought or a famine might cause that to happen. So it was really extraordinary that Abram had enough faith to leave his family to go to a place that he knew nothing about. So let's get to talking about the roles of families. So, my Bible class buddy Toby is here with me now. You might have heard him barking in a minute ago. So I want to talk just a little bit about the roles of each family member and kind of what they would do and maybe something that's unique about them. So the first one, of course, that we'll talk about is the role of the father. Now, if I can get it. The father would have usually worn, you've, you've seen me wear this the last time, the, the kefiya, right? He would have this over his head. Most of the people in the household would wear something like this, but definitely the father, he would wear something like this. Again, to, to protect his, his skin from the sun, uh, but also it was usually a, an indicator just of a role as well, that they would have more ornate and elaborate headdresses. So not only was a father the head of a household or a family, but also a father might be a leader of a city or a tribe. But within the family, he had the, the authority of making these big decisions about protecting his family and maybe where they would go and overseeing the work of his family. But he also would be a teacher, teaching skills maybe. If he was a, a, a carpenter, for instance, Joseph, the father of Jesus was a carpenter, and he would teach his son how to be a carpenter as well. Uh, but they would also do religious teaching, so they would teach them about God's word. So, also, there were mothers. Now, the women, Toby, I need my kefiyeth sheet. The women would wear a veil. They would actually cover almost half of their face, and it would be, you know, kind of a, a sign of modesty, that, that they would wear these kinds of things. But in, in most of the, what we're going to call pagan cultures, those are those that don't believe in the God Almighty, El Shaddai, uh, those Canaanite cultures. The women there, they, they were often treated as not much more than a servant. It was very common in those ancient times for women to, to haul and carry the wood or to just be cooks um, only look after children and sew clothes for everybody, milk the goats, etc., while the men, the husbands and fathers, would just relax with their friends. Uh, but, but it was customary for them to wear the veils for modesty and not really associate with any men outside of their family. 
However, I think it's important for us to know that that wasn't really God's plan. You know, when you look at Scripture, the Bible tells us that the wives, mothers, and sisters of God's chosen people, they were treated much more respectfully. While fathers were in charge of the, the family's work, and mothers were basically in charge of the homes. So women, they would, they would oftentimes be, be helping with uh, the washing of clothes around the house. They would have um, a soap actually made from wood ashes. They would use a stick actually to beat clothes. If you've ever had a, an old rug or something you needed to get the dirt out of, you actually would take a stick and whack on the rug and you could see the dust fly out of it. So that would be one way that they would get uh, dirt and things like that out of clothes. So they were, they were very much an important part of the house, but they would oversee many of the things going on in and around the house while the fathers would be outside of the house. Uh, many times the, the women actually oversaw the servants that tended their flocks of sheep and goats. Uh, they were responsible for drawing water from the wells each day. We'll talk about that in a minute. And they took care of children, but more, more importantly than any of those things, God's plan was for a mother and father to love, respect, and trust one another. Um, in Genesis chapter 23, you read the story about whenever Sarah, Abraham's wife, whenever she finally got old and, and she died at 127 years old. And how Abraham went to the land of the Hittites and he said, I need to find a place to bury my wife, Sarah. And he had a, a particular uh, place in mind. It was the cave of Machpelah. It's, it's at the end of a field. And he bought that for 400 shekels of silver so that he could bury his wife. He loved her and he wanted to mourn for her. And you can see also in uh, Genesis chapter 24, 67, uh, Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. He, he was very much sad to see his mother go. Now, there were not only fathers and mothers, there were also children. Children's roles in their families, they were considered a, a wonderful blessing from God. And, and typically, in ancient times, people wanted very large families. Uh, interestingly, it was considered to be kind of shameful if, if you didn't have children, and especially if you didn't have sons. Uh, so, at the time, the birth of sons was apparently much more celebrated because the sons would carry on the family name and they also frequently would stay and help with the work of the family while daughters that married would actually go and live with their husband's family so they would leave their father's household and go to their husband's household now children they were supposed to be very respectful and very loving of their parents a child actually might greet his or her parents by bowing down to them and they would kiss their hands. That's different than what we do today, isn't it? Now, children also learned to be very responsible at very young ages. Boys, they would work alongside their fathers, learning to be shepherds out in the fields, or they would learn to be farmers or maybe even businessmen. While the girls, they would be with their mothers, learning these domestic skills of um, how to go and, and get the water, how to make clothing for the family, because again, you couldn't go to Walmart and buy it. Uh, daughters, interestingly, were responsible for keeping oil in lamps burning at home. Look at this picture. You've heard of people talk about rubbing a lamp and a genie comes out as you know, goofy story. Those kinds of lamps would be very similar to what they were burning oil in back at this time. But daughters also would help their brothers tending the, the sheep and the goats. You also would have <clears throat> grandparents. And of course, they were there also to help instruct uh, the children in daily tasks and in their religious teachings. Children, again, were very much taught to respect and honor their parents and grandparents. Think about Isaac and his parents, Abraham and Sarah. They were really old enough to be grandparents at the time. But another interesting point, Abraham, it says he died when he was 175 years old. Isaac was born whenever he was 100, and when Isaac was 60, they had Jacob and Esau. So Abraham would have been 
a grandfather for about 15 years before he died, which I think is kind of interesting to think about. So that's kind of the roles of the family members. But I want to talk just a little bit about a custom, <clears throat> one that's a little different to us, particularly in the United States. In the Middle East, parents would choose a wife or they would choose a husband if they had a daughter for their children. Um, Abraham wanted Isaac's wife to come from his homeland, from his own relatives, instead of a Canaanite woman. There would be the concern that the Canaanite woman might draw him away from God Almighty into their pagan temple worship. So Isaac was somewhere near 37 years old. At least we know that whenever his mother died, he was about 37. And he was willing to wait for his father to choose his wife. Now, just for reference, I am 37, and I have been married for 12 years already. Isaac had not yet been married. So Genesis chapter 24 is really an interesting chapter. We're going to read quite a bit of it. But there's an unusual custom. It's kind of, it's kind of funny. This comes from verse 1 through 4. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his house, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. Hmm. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but you will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife from my son, Isaac. What in the world? Put your hand under my thigh. What's that about? Well, it's kind of a way of making a promise or a covenant. We might do that, you know, a pinky promise, but really what we would do today is we would shake hands, right? That's very similar. Or maybe we would sign a contract. But this, this putting the hand under the thigh is kind of strange to me, but that would be a strong indicator that, yes, I will do this. I will get into a covenant with you. Now, Abraham asked his servant, go find a wife for my son. We don't know for sure who his servant was, but we believe it to be Eliezer of Damascus. It's a guess, but it's probably a good guess. So his servant went on his travels and he would definitely be looking for a well whenever he got there. He had many camels, I believe 10, and he was traveling quite a distance through a hot, dry, dusty land. So whenever he got there, he went to a well and he prayed to God, the woman that comes out and I ask, give me a drink. Says, sure, and I will give water to your camels. That's the one. And so he prays this prayer, and by the time he finishes, Rebecca walks up and he says, can I have a drink? And she says, yes, and I'll water your camels. So when Rebecca had watered his 10 thirsty camels, again, who could drink 20 gallons, maybe 25 each, he knew that he had found just the right young woman for Isaac. Now, look at this picture of this well. You can see here that there's like a, a trough next to the well, and it would be for bringing water up and pour it into the, the trough there for livestock like camels to be able to drink out of. You wouldn't, you wouldn't pour it on the ground or try to give them a drink like out of a glass like I would drink. So she would pour into something like that trough. Now, do you think you could carry water and handle those jars like Rebecca did? Well, how much did they weigh? The water jars, from what I understand, should have weighed something like 160 pounds because they would have a capacity of near 20 gallons of water. That's a lot. That's pretty heavy. Do you think you could carry a full jar of water like that? So for, for your reference, what I would encourage you to do, if you have a five-gallon bucket, see if you can fill it with water and carry it. Maybe even if you have two, that way you'd have 10 gallons, half of what she would carry. If you do, don't hurt yourself. But if you do, see if you can ask your parents to video and put that in the comments. I'd like to see. Um, but that will give you an appreciation of how much those things weigh. Now, most women, and usually children, they would actually go twice a day to the well, carry water back to their house. Now, these jars were not made of plastic or some easy-to-carry pitcher. They were stone or some kind of, of masonry pottery. Uh, so they were heavy before the water was poured in. Uh, water 
really was as precious as gold in Abraham's day. Again, look at, look at this picture of the well. They would be dug by hand, uh, usually through solid limestone, which would be tough. Sometimes they had steps carved into them so that you could get down to where the water was. Other wells, they would use ropes or maybe buckets, water skins or jars to, to draw out the water that would dip down and they would bring it up. Even some of them would have what's called a water wheel where it would spin and there would be a, a jar of water that would scoop on the way down and on the way up it would dump out into whatever you were using. All kinds of different things, but they would oftentimes have a little low wall around it to prevent animals from falling into the well. So those who owned wells were usually very important and wealthy people. And many times they would sell the water that was in the well or they would trade for their water. So Abraham's servant had to have been overjoyed whenever he learned that this beautiful young lady who drew water for all of his camels was actually Abraham's grand niece, or that's the granddaughter of his brother Nahor. Rebecca's parents and brother must have loved her very much. How do we know? Well, I think it'll be significant for us to spend some time reading this. So this comes from Genesis chapter 24, and we'll pick up in verse 22. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. Then he asked, Whose daughter are you? She said, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son that Milcah bore to Nahor. That's very important. Family members, exactly what they were looking for. So the man bowed down and worshipped God, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. This is, again, very significant. So she runs back to her, her mother's household and, and tells everybody about these things. Now, her brother Laban, he was still living. It sounds like Nahor had passed away at this point. But he hurried out to meet the man at the spring. He invites him to their house. And while he is at the house, he does not eat until he gets to tell them why he's there. And Laban says, yeah, tell us. So verse 34, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly and he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants and camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son in her old age and he has given him everything he owns. And my master made me swear an oath and said, you must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but go to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. Then I asked my master, what if the woman will not come back with me? He replied, the Lord, before whom I have walked faithfully, will send his angel with you and make your journey a success so that you can get a wife for my son from my own clan and from my father's family. You will be released from my oath if when you go to my clan and they refuse to give her to you, then you will be released from my oath. When I came to the spring today, he explains what he did. I came to the spring and I prayed, if this young woman will give water to me and my camels, let that be her. And Rebecca came and she did. Before I had finished praying, she was there. So I asked, whose daughter are you? The daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, from whom Milcah bore to him. Then he explains what he did. And he asks, now, if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, so I may know which way to turn. So Laban and Bethuel answered, this is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebekah. Take her and go and let her become the wife of your master's son as the Lord has directed. So he also gave them many gifts and things that, that were like a bride price. They would call a dowry. The next morning they woke up. He said, send me on my way to my master. But her brother and mother replied, let the young woman with us stay with us for 10 days or so. Then you can go. But he says, don't, don't detain me. The Lord has granted me success. Send me on my way. So they said, well, let's ask the young woman, which is unusual. They said, we're going to ask her what she wants to do. 
will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent her on her way with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. Uh, then Rebecca and her attendants got ready and mounted the camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebecca and left. As they were approaching Isaac, verse 64, Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, who is the man walking in the field to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. She took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comfort, comforted after the death of his mother. So this is what we would call an arranged marriage. So you've got to go find this woman. She didn't even meet Isaac. The man just said, come be my, sir, uh, my master's wife. And she wanted to go. The family said, do you want to go? She said, I will go. So she finally saw Isaac off in the distance, got off of her camel, and she veiled herself. Why would you do that? Again, modesty. The women would veil themselves. But also, it was a sign of honor to her husband-to-be. Now, again, today, we have been talking about things. It's been a, a lot to talk about. But these are all things. There were customs and the way things worked at the time. And I think it's important for us to understand those unusual customs, the putting the hand under the thigh, the, the roles of the parents and the grandparents and the children and so forth. Uh, maybe even some of the technology. We talked about the oil lamp. We talked about the water and how, how they would um, water their, their flocks and herds. It's important to think about these things, to know these are not made up stories. These are real people. These things happened at real times in real places. They are not made up. And that means we can trust God's word. And that is an important thing to remember. So thank you for coming to Bible class today. I hope that you learned something. And I look forward to seeing you again on Sunday. Have a good week.